I'm singing an original song called It's Okay. It's Okay. Yeah. It is. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. What is It's Okay about? Uh, it's Okay is the story of the last year of my life. All right. And who are you here with? I'm here by myself. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do for a living? Um, I have not been working for quite a few years. I've been dealing with cancer. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. All right. Can, can I ask you a question? How are you now? Uh, last time I checked, I had some cancer in my lungs, my spine, and my liver. Wow. So you're not okay? Uh, well, not in every way, no. You got a beautiful smile and a beautiful glow, mm -hmm. and nobody would know. Thank you. It's important that uh, everyone knows I'm so much more than the bad things that yes. happen to me. Change my name thinking that it would change my mind. I thought that all my problems they would stay behind. I was a stick of dynamite, and it just was a matter of time, yeah. My family and I, we, uh, we're, we're big America's Got Talent fans. We watch it. It's something we do oftentimes in the summer because it's just this thing that's going on and it's a way for us to kind of come together to, to share something with one another. And that, that, that clip was from a season that happened two years ago. It was in the preliminary rounds, the audition rounds, and, and something that's so powerful about those, those rounds, it's, it's all about the stories. And that story that you saw was a, a woman by the name of Jane. The, the, the name that she goes by when she sings is, is Nightbird. And, and that story was just so captivating. It's one of those scenes and one of those clips and one of those auditions that I think everybody in our family at the end of it, we, all of us were emotional on, on so many different levels. On one hand, we're emotional because you hear her story and you hear her talent. And you just, you realize what a raw deal it is. Like what, what an awful thing that is that she's going through. So there's a part of you that's emotional because of just how sad it is. And here, let me just get it right out here in the, in the open. Like, you can be sad and still have faith. Like, you totally can. And I think sometimes we think that in order uh, to have faith, it means that we got to look at the difficult things in life and say, well, because we know the promise of Jesus, that doesn't give us permission to be sad. There's no truth in that. Absolutely no truth in that. Jesus comes to the grave of a guy by the name of Lazarus. And even though Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from death to life, Jesus sees the grief in the community and he weeps. You can, and so there's a sadness to it. But there was also a part of that clip and a part of her story that it was emotional because it was so incredibly inspirational. Did you hear what she had to say? She describes what it is that's going on in her life and, and, and the judges can't believe that she'd be able to look at it and say, no, it's, it's going to be okay. And on one hand, you can hear that. On one hand, you can look at it and, and, and think, maybe there's something wrong with her. Maybe she hasn't come to grips with reality. Maybe she hasn't fully realized the, the, the gravity of what's going on in her life. But then you see that it's something deeper. It's in the, the portion of the song that you heard just a minute ago. She said, and I, and I love this. And I feel like these, these lyrics are incredibly invitational. She says, if you're lost... We're all a little lost. It's not just her words, it's, it's the words of Jesus. Who says to, to, to his followers, who says through God's living word to all of us, at the end of his life, like he's just about to, to go to the cross and Jesus says, in this world, in this life, this side of heaven, you're going to face trials and you're going to face troubles of every kind. Like, but sometimes I think we feel that to admit that we're struggling or to admit that we're going through pain, to admit that it's not okay, we think that somehow that would be an indictment on our character. And so when people ask us how it's going, we, we have to say and pretend that it's all okay. 
So Jane, she says, if you're lost, we're all a little lost and it's all, it's, it's all right. And, and there was so much depth to it. Like the way she said it and the way she sang it, you, you knew that it was something that she felt deep inside of her soul. After she got done performing, like literally like the Instagram world, the Twitter world, it just went wild because people couldn't understand it. And so I, I started to do a deep dive on her. Like what was it? What, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I thought to myself, there, there has to be faith there. Because how could you face the things that she's facing, facing with that kind of confidence, with that kind of joy and and do that without faith. And, and here's what she says. She said, occasionally extreme circumstance interjects itself into your life. And I'm convinced and I know that there are more than a handful of us that are worshiping here in person or online this evening. That are here in the wake of an extreme circumstance that's interjected itself into our life. And we're here and we're trying to figure out, like, what does life look like in the wake of something like that? And sometimes we say, well, we hear her story and she had cancer and she had that. And, and my story, like, my, the, the struggle that I'm going through, it doesn't equate to that. Why do we compare it like that? Like, the struggle means to experience something in life that wasn't the way that God intended it to be. And it doesn't need to be compared with another person's struggle. And so your extreme circumstance that's interjected itself into your life might be and probably is quite different than somebody else's. But if it's robbing life from you, it's not from God. Occasionally extreme circumstance interjects itself into your life and your live and laugh and love sign proves to be even more absurd than it normally does. And here it is. Forgive me, Jane says, forgive me if this offends you. But I have a better friendship with God. And because I remain soft-hearted and tender toward him, in a life where sometimes nothing makes sense, I know that it's going to be okay. And it, and it is. And you might be saying, Jeremy, you have no clue what it is that's interjected itself into my life. But I know the promise of the God who's interjected himself into all of our lives. I know the reality of the fact that in life sometimes things just break down. They just do. I experienced that. Our family experienced that in a real way just over a week ago. We went to Duluth on a family vacation two, uh, two weeks ago tomorrow. We went Monday through Friday. Monday night we got into Duluth, actually went north to two harbors. We, we were there and we, uh, we, we did the whole thing and we spent Monday night there, Tuesday, Wednesday. And on Thursday we were coming back to Minneapolis because we were going to go watch God's team play baseball. We were going to watch the Twins play at Target Field in Minneapolis. It was fantastic. They actually won, which they haven't been doing much of lately. It was fantastic. But on Thursday we kind of had a tight window of time. And the reason we had a tight window of time is because we're going to leave uh, two harbors. We're going to get to Minneapolis. We're going to go. We're going to pick up lunch. On the way, we actually stopped and we saw Bridget's cousin just north of Minneapolis and we were going to get lunch and then go to our hotel. After we went to our hotel, then we had to go have time for our kids to swim because like if you have kids of a certain age or, or younger, you could be in the most exotic place on earth and the first question they would ask is, do they have a pool? Like literally, like you could be at one of the seven wonders of the world and the biggest thing that they're concerned about is, is there an, a, a rectangular shape that has chlorine that I can jump into? So we're going to do that. We're going to find time to swim. After we swam, we're going to get all of our gear on, our twin stuff on. We're going to hit the light rail and that would drop us off right at Target Field where we could watch the twins play. We had it all planned out. So we stopped by Bridget's Cousins. We get, we get to Minneapolis. We're literally 0.4 miles from our hotel. We're going to grab Jimmy John's that was uh, just around the corner. And there was a really easy way to get to Jimmy John's. But I'm not a person that usually takes the easy way. Like there was a logical way to get there. And I thought, I'm going to go through like this like abandoned parking lot. So I start, and Bridget said to me, she's like, do you think this is a good idea? And I'm like, oh, it would be fine. Which I received no confidence from my kids when I said that. 
because they know that I get, our, get us into trouble way too often. So I start going through this abandoned parking lot, and the potholes in this parking lot were so big, it would make the Grand Canyon blush. I mean, it was awful. Like, we're going through the parking lot, and our kids are, like, getting seasick because of how bad our car is jerking around. And they're like, Dad, is this going to be fine? I'm like, trust me, it'll be good. We get to Jimmy John's, Bridget goes in, she gets her sandwich, and then we just have to take a right turn out of the parking lot and a right turn onto the frontage road, and we're going to be there, and our night was going to continue. So we take a part, uh, right out of the parking lot, and pretty soon we hear this noise. It's just going like, duh, 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 duh. and I thought to myself, dear God, let that not be my tire. Let that not be my tire. Maybe it's just the fact that this road is almost as bad as the parking lot we were just in. So I knew that when I turned onto the frontage road that that was like smooth pavement. So I'm like, okay, once we turn onto the pavement, it's going to get better. And so the da 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 went to da 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 And our kids are like, what, what's happening? And so I turned back into the parking lot from hell. I turned back into there. And I get out of my car and... Like, we totally blew the back, we didn't blow the back, back wheel. I blew the back wheel, totally flat. And everyone's like, well, like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, trust me, like, I can, I can change a tire. There wasn't a lot of comf- confidence that was coming back towards me, so I was going to prove it. So we open up the back hatch of the car, and we get everything out of the back of our car. We get the tire out, we get the jack out. And why is it that the jacks they give you for your vehicles you start to wonder if they could even lift up a matchbox car. Like, those things are so small. And so I get the jack. We find out where we're going to put it, and I start to jack the car up, and it's going great, and we got the lug nuts loosened. we got all the whole thing, and I'm starting to think to myself, boy, we were broken down, but now I'm going to be the hero. And then Bridget said, you know, the, the ground doesn't seem very level. Maybe we should step away from the car. I'm like, no, it's going to be fine. Get the car even higher, and all of a sudden I hear from Bridget, it's like, it's going down! And literally, our car falls off of the jack. And now, we start to realize that every plan that we had has now been shot. And we're wondering, what on earth are we going to do? We thought we could fix it. And I think this, this, this picture, like, I think it just says the whole story. You got me who's trying to get ourselves out of the mess, but I have no business getting ourselves out of the mess. You got our daughter who's like trying to help as best she can. You have my, my wife who's just like, you know what? I trust it's going to be okay, so I'm just going to capture the whole thing and share this picture as an embarrassment. No, as a way to capture the memory. And then look at, look at Trey's face. Like, that's the best ever. He's like, just get me out of here. Like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be experiencing. Like, I would rather be, any, like, let's just, let, can we just abandon the car and walk away from the whole thing? But I think that all of us, when we face some sort of struggle, would fit into one of those categories, wouldn't we? Like, some of us who spend so much time, we try to, we just try to say, if, if I just work harder, then it all will just get better. And some of us say, well, if I can just get as helpful as we get. Or some of us are like, you know what, we'll just, we'll just capture it. And then like, we, we, we trust it's all going to work out. And, and some of us are like, you know what, I just want to go and I just, I just want to hide. But what we need is we need something more. We need something that runs deeper than what we have and can bring to the table. And that's why what we're encountering in Paul's letter to the Romans this evening is so life-giving for every single one of us. In the second week of this series uh, that we're doing called Romans Run Deep, Roman Runs Deep. And if you haven't been able to, to keep up with the Bible readings, that's fine. But I really encourage you, read the, read the book of Romans. If you say, I don't know if I can get through the book of Romans, read Romans chapter 8. Like Romans chapter 8 in, in, in my Bible and in any of the Bibles I have is the one that's underlined, it's highlighted, and it's starred. Like, read it tonight. Read it as a family tonight. Read it as an individual tonight. Like, go through it. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have access to uh, a a Bible app, like, literally walk out of the worship center tonight if you're here in person and grab a a free Bible and just take it and and underline it. Because Romans 8, what it will do is it will help us to understand how we find hope in the middle of our struggle. Like, literally, to have hope does not mean that our lives are absent of difficult things. We would think that way too often, that I can have hope when all of the difficulties kind of just like fall off to the side. Or I can have hope at the, 
at the other side of the difficulties that I might face. So I can have hope when everything is just perfect and everything is just the way that it should be when like, I'm hitting in everything just the, right on beat and wherever I should be hitting it. But that's just not life, is it? I mean, at least that's not my life. Because there's a difference about knowing that things are going to go wrong at times and experiencing it. I mean, intellectually, Jesus, we hear Jesus' word that, that says, in this world you're going to face trials and troubles of every kind. And intellectually, we know that, that to be true. But when we experience it, everything changes. This is John chapter 14. Jesus had just told his disciples just before this. He just told them that the time had come where he was going to lay down his life. Now, intellectually, they knew. He had told them the way this whole thing was going to play out. They knew what was before them. But now it had just gotten real. And in the moment when it had gotten real, their minds were absent. Like, they, they didn't know how to make sense of it. And then Jesus says these words in John chapter 14, which when we read them at first blush, blush it almost seems to be offensive, doesn't it? Because Jesus says to his disciples, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. And there's that moment where you almost wonder, are you serious? Like, are, are you so callous to the reality, the disciples would have probably been thinking, that, that we left everything to follow you. We put a lot on the line, Jesus, to be one of your followers, and, and there's a lot that's at stake, and, and now you're telling us that you're, you're going to be gone now, and you're telling us to not let our hearts be troubled? Do you have your head in the sand? Are you out of touch with reality? Trust you? Trust God? How does that work when we're in the middle of a struggle? I think that's one of the, the most common questions that we have. Like hope and trust, how do we, where do we even look to find it? It was this last Tuesday, like honestly, just this last Tuesday, there was a young woman from our church family that came into our office. It was about 11.30, 11.45. She came in and she wanted to talk to someone because she had just found out that, that her cousin who lives out of state had violently, her cousin's life had violently been taken from her. And not only did she have to come to terms with the reality of what happened, but, but it was done in such a way that not just the, the, the regional news of where it happened had picked it up, but also there were, like, this was like a CNN kind of story. So she's hearing all of these details of what had been done to her cousin, and she came in and she said, I don't, I don't, need, I don't even know where I should start. She said, and if I'm going to be honest, a lot of the people that I've started to share this with me, they, they're saying things like, well, this just must be a part of God's plan. Or maybe God needed her more than we did. And she said it, like, really quite honestly. So, Jeremy, I just need to know, is that true? Is what happened to my cousin a part of God's plan? I'm sure a lot of us are asking the question about the things that are happening in our own lives. If God is good, then why, why would he want this to happen to me? So then we start to think about hope and finding hope and it seems to be almost impossible because we can't even really find God. Like where is God when we're facing things like we're facing? And that's a very, it's a very appropriate question. It's biblical if I'm going to be honest. 
we're reading through the whole Holy Bible, we're preaching on the, the New Testament text, but we're also reading through the Old Testament. We're getting really close to the time where we're going to read through the book of Psalms. And so many of the Psalms were written about, about the joy and about the, the, the mountaintop experiences. It's Psalm chapter 8 where, where David writes, my Lord, our God, how majestic is your name. Your, your glory fills the whole earth. And there's plenty of Psalms that talk about the, the enormity, the grandeur, the, the, the majesty of God. But there's also a whole section of psalms that the psalmist pours their heart out to God and asks really honest and tough questions. They're the lament psalms where the psalmist will say, God, how long are you going to hide from me? How long are you going to hide your face from me? Oh Lord, my Lord, where, where are you? And, and the truth is, is those psalmists weren't putting the words together like that in some rhetorical strategy to make it sound pretty. I believe the psalmist puts those in those psalms because they want an answer. God, your promise is that you'll be here. God, your promise is that you're going to be good. God, your promise is that you're a God who has a steadfast love that endures forever. And if that were to be true, God, then show your face. Quit hiding from me. Let me know where you are in the middle of my struggle. And this is the beauty and the power of what God speaks through Paul's writing when he writes to the church in Rome. Romans chapter 8, the biblical scholars will say that the book of Romans is like the Himalayas and, and chapter 8 is like Mount Everest. Like it's the height of the whole thing. And it speaks directly into the middle of the reality of our experiences no matter where it is we find ourselves right now. And the hope that we can find when we can first find out where is God, where is God? He's with you. He's not going before you. He's not coming after you. He's not going beside you. He's not hovering over you. No, God's word promises that he lives inside of you. He inhabits you. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, the spirit of God, think about this. If this were to be true, and it is, think about the power and the promise and the presence of God, especially when we suffer, that the spirit of God that took the, 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 the body of Jesus Christ that had no life left in it, the same spirit that took Jesus and raised him to, from death to life, lives inside of you. There's, there's not a place that you could go or a place that you could find yourself where he would remove himself. Holy Spirit is a gift that God gives us. The presence of God in the present tense that lives with us and reminds us that not only does he live inside of us, that he also claims us. Paul goes on, Romans chapter 8, verse 15. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. This word Abba that Paul uses in the Greek of the New Testament, it would be a term for a father that would elicit a, a term of intimacy, of tenderness, of closeness. But there was more to it than just that. That in the age in which Paul was writing, children were to be seen and not heard. And if a child, it's Jesus who kind of rocks the boat when he says, no, let the children come to me as the disciples were trying to push them away. And so if a child were go, to, to go into a place that was, was inhabited by, by adults and were to speak without being invited would be subject to the punishment of anybody else in any way that they saw fit. Except for the one that was with the father who could call him Abba. Because that child was chosen. The highest privilege, 
the highest honor. That when the child had been given the right to call his father Abba, everybody know, knew that whatever was the father's was given to the child. And it was hands off that child. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, God says that whatever is mine has now become yours. And nothing gets to get in the way of that. We, we, we wander through life sometimes. And we struggle sometimes to, to, to figure out who we are and why we're here and how we become who we're supposed to become. And there are so many things that are going on around us all of the time that we, we, we have this identity piece that begins to, be, begins to become so difficult, especially in difficulty. God's word reminds us you never have to question who you are or whose you are. And not only does he claim you, but he also, he gives you a voice when you don't have it. One of the, one of the greatest privileges I have in my job is I... I'm given the opportunity to be with people at some of the most difficult times in their lives. There's a lot of you that are here today that have been able to be a part of that with you. It's an incredible honor. And there's so many times in those moments where we, where, where I might say, you know, how can I pray for you? So often the response is, I don't, I don't even know. I don't even have the words to, to tell you, to ask you what it is that I need. But God does. Romans 8, 28, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's just how good and generous God is. He just doesn't want anything that would, I mean, God created us to have the strength that would allow us to soar on wings like eagles. And so when he finds us weak, he steps in and, and he helps us. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, Romans 8, 28. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings. That word groanings, it literally means inexpressible sighs. With groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And God is... In you, and he claims you, and he speaks for you. I say, good, but I still don't know how it is that I find hope. Where do I turn to, to find hope? Paul's not done, and neither is God. Paul goes on in Romans 8, 28. He says, we know that the spirit, that God causes everything to work together for the good. It almost sounds cliche to say it. But the wasteland times of our life are never wasted. And God works through, God's light shines in the darkness no matter how dark the darkness can feel. It was a little over a year ago, there was a, a woman by the name of Cheryl and her daughter Ellie and her husband Kevin. And they had a son whose name was Brady. And Cheryl called because the night before, Brady had ended his life. And I'll, I'll just never, I just think it's really important that we continue to talk about how desperate a person gets to in a place where they find that there is no answer to the hopelessness that they feel. And I just really want to remind you that there is help that's always available to you. We have a phone number here at Hope. 
that somebody answers that phone, call, that phone number 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year. Doesn't matter if it's a holiday, doesn't matter what time of the day it is. Like if you're in a place where you're wondering where do I turn, where do I go to find hope. I don't know if I can get through this night on my own. Please call. Don't suffer on your own. So Cheryl and Ellie, and they, they were just trying to figure out, like, was there any way that their life could ever continue on after they had lost Brady the way that they did? And in this past January, we had a, a worship night on a Saturday night during our 5 p.m. service. We have a wonderful artist who's a part of our church family. Her name is Renee. She's incredibly gifted. She'll paint uh, live during worship services. She'll do that at Easter. She'll do that at Christmas services. She was doing it at that worship service. And she had gone into that evening and she had just said, you know what, I'm not going to go into that evening with a plan. I'm just going to go up and I'm going to trust that God will like kind of, God will kind of just give me, inspire me. And in, in, to inspire means inspirited, that God's spirit is going to, to move in me and I, I'm, I'm going to paint whatever I feel led to paint in that moment. Which was kind of terrifying for her, but she started to do it. And, and Cheryl and her husband, Kevin, were at worship that night. And they saw Renee and they saw her painting. And something just connected with them in ways that they could never imagine. But the miracle of what this story becomes is that Renee had found herself at a point in her life where she was in, a pl same pl in the same place where Brady was. And she barely made it through. And she always wondered how that part of her life could ever be redeemed. It's an incredible story. Take a look. I grew up Christian. My mom worked for the church for a long time. And, you know, I went to Sunday school and got confirmed and all that stuff. But I strayed so far away for 20 plus years that, you know, I was just, um, I was at the darkest place in my, my life before I came to work here in 2017. We lost Brady on a Tuesday and the following Tuesday was the day of his funeral here at Hope. You, you want to know they're okay. You're always looking for signs. Give me signs. Let me know that you're okay. I was never trained to paint or anything. I, my dad's an artist, my brother's an artist, and my grandpa, and so it just kind of runs in the family. Jen from the art ministry, she and I had talked for the last few years about painting prophetically, and that was something I was not interested in doing because it just sounded scary, not having a plan. Prophetic art, for those who don't know, is really just tuning into God and the Holy Spirit. I don't try to plan what I'm gonna put in there. I'm just trying to completely surrender it all to God in that moment. God was drawing me in. I was immediately drawn to Renee doing her thing, and I, I just saw his face, and I started crying, and I nudged Kevin, and I said, look at the painting, and I heard him say, Brady. I got the email from Cheryl, and she explained that she saw her son's face in the painting. And I was in tears that, you know, somebody had felt so connected to it. It just resonated really deeply with me because I've been there many times for 20 plus years. A consistent feeling I felt for a lot of years was wanting to die um, because of my addictions and, and the stuff I was going through. The darkness that I felt for so long to connect, it just reaffirms why I'm following Jesus. It was almost like I heard Jesus say, I've got this. I've got him, and I've got this, and I've got you, and he's okay. We know because of the goodness of God that God works to together in all things for good. Now you have to know that God didn't cause that to happen. It's not that God said, well, somehow I'm going I'm, I'm to do these things to these people so these things happen. But God says, I'll, I'll, I'll work through it. I mean, 
Renee is just one of the, the many people, just not a, just a part of hope, just in this world that have incredible gifts. And her art is in the chapel right now. So if after worship you want to go down to the chapel, check it out. It's incredible. She just allows God to say, hey, God, here's my story. Here's the brokenness of who I am. And God, I trust that you're going to do something that will bring beauty in the ash that felt that was present for so long in my life. And the only way that she can do it is because she has a God who fights for her. And so do you. That God will literally, he fights for you. Romans chapter 8, Paul goes on. If God is for us, Paul says, who could ever be against us? And then Paul says, does it mean that God doesn't love us? If we face danger or we're destitute or we're threatened with death, if we experience horrible things, does that mean that God doesn't love us? No, God fights for us. Like in that day in the parking lot, I needed a champion. Like I couldn't do it on my own. And my champion was our insurance agent. I called him. I'm like, Doug, we're in Minneapolis. Our tire is blown. What do we do? And he said, like, just you have roadside assistant. And we're like, praise Jesus. And he said, if you open this app on your phone, you can see the fact that rescue is coming. And so we looked at that. And we're like, oh, we're almost saved. We're going to be safe. And that was just the mechanic who was incredibly kind. But we have something that we can look to that tells us, like, hey, we have salvation. We, we, we can see who we are and we can see who he is and we can see the fact that we know how the story ends. And even though it gets difficult in the middle sometimes, we know that rescue is on the way because we have a God who fights for us, who loved us so much that he went to the cross and he gave his life so that we might have ours. Like he gave his life, he gave, he literally went to death on the cross and was raised to the new life so that we could be joined with him and so that we could have a victory. Overwhelming victory is ours, Paul goes on. That neither the valleys or the peaks could, could ever be anything that could equate to the victory that's given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who loves us. The story on AGT, it's just like the story of Jane and of this night of Nightbird, it's so profound. Because on the on the show that day, like she won. Like she absolutely won. But as you hear her in this last final clip, as you hear her, you start to see that the victory that she's claiming isn't how she does on the show. With all due respect, those things, they just don't matter that much. They're wonderful. They're great. They bring momentary happiness. But what Jane is holding on to, the victory that she's holding on to, you'll, you'll hear it. And don't just listen to her words. Listen to the sound of the music and the words of the music that's being sung underneath her in her final interview. It's... It's absolutely inspiring. It rocked a, a whole segment of people. Because joy like this, in times like that, it's not the way the world sees it. God says, come closer. Because no matter how difficult your struggle is, it's not going to last forever. And I don't say that flippantly, and I don't say that like callously, and I don't say that like being distant from where you are and what you're going through. No, I say that because, because God's word says there's only three things that last forever. Only three. Faith and hope and love and the greatest is love. Like God's victory puts to death all of the things that take life from us. So as you hear her, think about you. It's powerful. It's a truth. And hold on to it. Take a look. You can't wait until life isn't hard anymore before you decide to be happy. Um. There are, however, there have been some great singers this year. 
um, and I'm not going to give you a yes. I'm going to give you something else. chance of survival, but 2% is not 0%. 2% is something. And I wish people knew how amazing it is. 2%. Physically, I have a 2% chance of making it. But I wish people realized how great that 2% is. Because what I'm holding on to is something bigger than that. I've had the opportunity to, to, to preach all weekend, and I don't know why this one's harder. It's just harder. I think it's because my kids are here. And as adults, we know that things are hard and they're difficult, and we just want our kids to know that when that happens, how loved they are. But maybe we need to know that as well. My goodness, God's love is so good. God's love is so powerful. God's grace is so amazing. Don't let anything that's going on in your life distract you from the reality that God came for you. If you were the only one, he came for you. This is like, this is a story that, a, a song that she wrote in the middle of her struggle. Listen to the belief here. Listen to the power. Listen to the certainty that she has. Believing gets hard when options are few. Can't we relate? When I can't see what you're doing, I know that you're proving, somehow I know what you're proving, that you're the God who always comes through. He will come through for you. He has come through for you. His promise is for you. His love is for you. His grace is for you. His promise, his, the whole thing is for you. He went to the cross for you. Never lose sight of that. Hold on to that. And here's the promise, and here's the promise that the ultimate point of Romans chapter 8 is even when it feels like we can't hold on to that 2% any longer, God says, you can let go because I'll catch you. And nothing can separate you from that. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Not our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell, Paul says, could ever separate you from the love of God that's revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can count on that. You can build your life on that. That can be the living hope that you have. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything's ready, I'll come and get you so that where I am, you also will be. And you know the way it is to where I'm going, Paul says. And Thomas, because of everything that's going on, Thomas is like, Christ, no, Lord. We don't know. How could we ever know the way? Because sometimes in our struggle, it feels like we're wandering through the darkness. I remember when, when I was little, like I was one of those kids that was just deathly afraid of the dark. Like the four, first 42 years of my life. No, I'm just kidding. But when I was little, I was so scared. And so that my bedroom was on the same floor where that my parents, would, they would watch TV at night and I would always tell my mom and dad, you have to watch TV and you have to watch TV with the light on until I go to sleep. And my mom would always say, hey, Jeremy, even if the light's off, you know that I'm here. But I would say to them, but when I can't see you and I can't hear you, and in the darkness, I start to question. Man, that's just true, isn't it? Jesus says to Thomas, hey, Thomas, I know that when, when, when things start veering off the path, I know that it gets difficult, 
But Thomas, you don't have to find me. You just need to know me. Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is for Thomas. He is for Cheryl. He is for Renee. He was for Brady. He was for Jane. Most importantly, he is for you. So we're going to close tonight. I, I was going to have people stand up if they're going through a difficult season in life, but then I realized that because of the culture we live in, nobody would stand up. So we're all going to stand up. So I invite you all to stand, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song called Living Hope, and then we're going to go home. And then we're going to love people like crazy the way that Jesus loved them. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give just a moment, and I invite you to lift anything up that's going on that, that's caused you to struggle. And then we're going to give thanks to God for being who he is and trust him with what he does. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being a God who's good. God, I just know that there's a lot of stuff that's going on in a lot of people's lives right now. And a lot of times where we're struggling to find you and we're struggling to find hope. And so all of those things and anything else, God, right now, we just lift those things up to you. God, we thank you for being a God who answers. We thank you for being a God who says yes to us. We thank you for being a God who is present and who is near. And we trust that you, God, are going to continue to move. And we thank you for that. And pray it all in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. And everybody together said, Amen. Amen.